Before you all get up and leave, uh, just a quick reminder that we are actually about to have the Distinguished Lecturer Award uh, because Ian has finally made it here after his long walk. Uh, so I'm looking around the room. I'm looking for David Macklin, who was going to do the introductions yesterday. Is, do we have him in the room? Intr David, David is not around. I don't see David. Okay, so uh, I'm going to take it upon myself. Uh, pardon me? Well, it's 5.30, let's do this. Okay, so I'm going to take it upon myself. Uh, no, actually, you know what? We do have someone in the room. Uh, Gord, where are you? Yeah, why didn't you come up here and say something? Because you're the science committee. I know, that's why we put you to work right away. Gord, you want to come up here and do the duties? Yeah, everybody just arrived. Okay. Well, we don't see David. We don't see David. No. David, one, two, three, going, gone. That's it. All right. So the Distinguished Award Lecture is the, uh, that's the premier lecture. You know, award that the uh, Canadian Obesity Network has to give, has to, you know, give people who've been working in the obesity field, uh, and have actually made a difference and made a huge contribution. And so, uh, uh, the process it's a it's a very transparent process. There are nominations for people who people think deserve the award, and then uh, you know there's a there's a submission of CVs, and then there's actually a committee. There's a subcommittee of the science committee that actually looks at this, and then. Uh, decides it's always a very very hard decision to make because there are many people who are deserving of the award but you know there's always going to be another summit and there's going to be another opportunity well this year uh, it's uh, Ian Jansen from the uh, uh, from Queen's University in Kingston who's uh, well the official recipient of the award uh, I don't have a CV in front of us so I'm going to ask uh, Ian to tell us, and I'm sure that he's going to do it anyway, going to tell us a little bit about himself and what it is that he does. Uh, I just do want to mention that uh, Ian has been one of the founding members of the network. He's been, uh, he's been with the network ever since, and he has also served for many years uh, actually as the chair of the uh, science committee, uh, but obviously had no involvement in giving himself this award. So, <laughs> <laughs> so Ian, <laughs> congratulations, and I'd like to invite you to the podium. Thank you all for uh, sticking around, and uh, it's a great honor to be here. And I see Diane's there, the first recipient of this award. Uh, and I tell you, 4,000 kilometer walk from Kingston, Ontario to Banff. I was doing pretty good till I hit Saskatchewan, Regina area, and then I hit this headwind. <laughs> then I got to the mountains, and I forgot about how hilly they were, and then the snow. So it took me a little bit longer than I anticipated, but the good news is, 4,000 kilometers equals 200,000 calories, <laughs> or about 59 pounds of fat. So I'm feeling much better than I was a, f a few days ago. Uh, that's a nice segue into uh, the title of my talk, which is about the misunderstood role of physical activity in childhood obesity. Um, and there's two sort of two misunderstandings. The first is that you just do a little bit of activity and the pounds are going to melt off, and I'll tell you that's an absolute falsehood. And the second is that physical activity has no role in the management, prevention, or treatment of obesity, and that's also a falsehood. And I'm gonna focus a little bit more on that second part. Uh, and I'll say that this, uh, following from Jimena's talk, I feel really bad because it is more of a public health perspective on this issue. So this doesn't necessarily speak to all individuals, and there certainly are individual variations in the ability of physical activity to influence body weight. So keep that in mind, we're talking about group effects. Uh, and primarily from a prevention public health standpoint. And this does not speak to all individuals, and I'll highlight that at some points in the presentation. So I'm going to start uh, my presentation by going back to when I was a grad graduate student, and in 1998 this document was published by the National Institutes of Health, which is really the first clinical guidelines for obesity prevention and management. And this was uh, confusing to me because one of the main conclusions in this document is as stated here, and you see back in 1998, we did not use people first language, so we've had some nice improvements there. This is a quote, so I wouldn't use that term, the terms myself. 
but basically saying that obesity, uh, physical activity is not really important in terms of obesity. And this was in adults. And this was kind of confusing to me at the time because uh, the lab where I was doing my, work, my research, which was with Bob Ross at Queen's University, we were doing exercise interventions in persons with class one obesity. And what we were able to find in those studies is that if we got people to do a lot of physical activity, they would lose weight, not 100 pounds, no way, but we, we could get them to lose about a pound or two a week if they were doing a lot of physical activity. In this situation, it was about an hour of walking a day. And we then reviewed that literature and really got an understanding of why, you know, the statements as such were in that NIH document, and that's because you see that large clumping of studies there on the left of the graph, and that's when most of the studies are doing physical activity interventions for weight loss, they prescribe very little physical activity. If you do 30 minutes of physical activity five days a week, it's going to do great things for your health. It's not going to have hardly any influence on your weight. So we sort of understood that, and being a very naive graduate student, I thought, you know, we're going to publish these studies and the world is going to change. <laughs> well, you know, many years down the road, uh, you know, meta-analysis, and now my research focus is now more on kids, and we see the exact same thing. So I'm here today to talk to you about some of these misconceptions around this, and really four reasons why I think the role of physical activity in childhood obesity is misunderstood. So reason one, when you look at the liter and, and reason one relates to observational studies looking at the relationship between physical activity and, and body weight or waist circumference or body fat percentage. And, and most of this research, you need to be aware, uses invalid measures of physical activity and shows very weak associations between physical activity and measures of adiposity or body fat or obesity, whatever you want to say. Very weak associations or no associations. But what you need to keep in mind is that the way that people measure this historically is absolutely terrible. Uh, imagine if you asked a 10-year-old, you know, how much physical activity did you get in the past week? Well, they've got to remember back to what they did. They've got to think about what is physical activity, and they're probably going to lie because they want to tell you, you know, that they were more active than they really were. We call that a sort of a social desirability bias, and people do that for all kinds of behaviors. So we're trying to, you know, get away from this self-reported data in these observational studies. And in our lab and many others in Canada, we now use accelerometers. This is just an advanced Fitbit, if you're used to using a Fitbit. Um, they're truly a black box, though, in that they don't give any information to the participants. So they don't know how many steps they've got or how many minutes of physical activity they got. We can figure that out after the, after the data is collected. And unlike the Fitbit type things where you get sort of one number at the end of the day, how many steps you've taken, the accelerometers tell us minute by minute what the people are doing. And this is a, an example of accelerometer data for one kid for one day. And this kid woke up at around 7 o'clock and their accelerometer was on and then as they went throughout the day you can see the accelerometers recording their movement. And the higher those bars, the more vigorous the movement. And we can have sort of these thresholds that define where we get to certain intensities of activity. This red line here represents the threshold for moderate to vigorous physical activity. And we can count essentially, or I don't, we don't manually count this, the computer does it for us, but we can count how much they get. And you can't fool an accelerometer. People say, well, what if the people do this? I go, they'll do that for a minute. They will not do that for 60 minutes. <laughs> if they do, it's actually good because it's physical activity. <laughs> and what we see is that when we look at, in Atlanta, I told you you were going to be made famous here. Here you are. This is a part of Atlanta LeBlanc's a master's thesis. And what, what Atlanta was able to show is when you look at how these accelerometer measures of physical activity relate to uh, questionnaire measures, you see two things. The first is at low and moderate levels of physical activity, people greatly overreport how much activity they do. The second thing that you see with those R numbers, the correlations, is that these measures are poorly related. And what that means is, is you have a lot of error, a lot of error in your physical activity measure, and then when you go and try and relate that with some other variable, whether it be obesity or blood pressure or the built environment or anything, 
there's going to be a lot of error in that association and you're not going to be able to detect things that really exist or detect weak associations that are really strong. And what we find is that when you look at associations, when you measure physical activity really well, and you take the time and the care and use the technology to do it, you see very, very strong relationships with measures of body weight or body fat or blood pressure or other health measures. And in this situation here, uh, the most active children were five times less likely to have a BMI in the overweight or obese range. That does not mean that everybody that was active had a healthy or a low BMI and that everybody that was highly active or on the other end had a high BMI. That's not true. And in fact, in our data, some of the most active kids have very high BMIs. But on average, this is the patterns that you see. So we see very, very strong relationships when we measure physical activity well. Reason number two. The focus has been a lot on these what I call adult models of physical activity, measuring and prescribing bouts of activity. So when you as an adult do your activity, and you think of going to the gym for example, we would call that a bout of activity. You go run on the treadmill or do the elliptical or heaven forbid, go outside and get a walk. Uh, what we see is about a physical activity. And this is an accelerometer data from a very, very active adolescent. Again, this line here, this red line represents moderate to vigorous. And for this adolescent, you see three distinct bouts. They're exercising at a high intensity for at least 10 consecutive minutes. And I want you to think about children. And do you think a lot of kids do that? Not really, right? Their activity tends to be more like this stuff that you see on the other side, this sporadic or intermittent activity, right? It's all over the place. They go out and play and they run for a couple minutes and they stop for a couple minutes. They're all over the place. So if we measure the bouts, we're missing out on that sporadic stuff. And what we see in young people is 66%, two thirds of their activity is the sporadic stuff. And that sporadic stuff is not even very strongly related to the bouted physical activity. And the younger the kids get, the more and more the sporadic is. So if you go in a preschooler, there's no bouts of activity. They're not doing 10 minutes to sustain moderate to vigorous physical activity. You show me one preschooler that can do that, and I will give you a million dollars, <laughs> which is the exact amount of the award that I'm getting here today. <laughs> I'm going to bankrupt Khan. So it's important that we measure the sporadic stuff because it's the stuff that kids do and it's also, you know, bouts of activity are important and certainly the more bouts, the more minutes you accumulate with bouts, the better your health and here we're looking at the metabolic syndrome. I could put many, many different health outcomes there. You'd see the same thing. But so too with sporadic. In fact, when you match minute by minute, the benefits of sporadic are the same as the benefits for bouts. So I say you can do 10 minutes all at once or do 10 minutes 10 different times in one minute intervals, the benefits would be the same. So we also need to think about this when we start thinking about you know, what strategies we want to use for treatments, or what policies might we want to have. And this is a, a policy that sort of, it's a typical thing that talks about you know, 20 minutes to sustain moderate to vigorous physical activity. This is the Ministry uh, of Education in, in my province of Ontarable, as Jimena calls it, uh, this is their policy for daily physical activity and it's such a, such a horrendous policy that the government of Alberta and the government of BC thought, you know, Ontario has such a bad policy, we should adopt the same thing. <laughs> and this is terrible because it's, you know, 20 minutes to sustain moderate to vigorous physical activity. Kids don't do that. Uh, I asked my kids, I asked my son this week, I was tracking what he does for his DPA and yesterday it was Lego because it was raining outside, so they didn't want to go, so it was Lego, and I guarantee you there was not one minute of moderate to vigorous <laughs> physical activity with Lego. It probably was light intensity. When the weather is nice, this is what his teacher does. They bring them out to their path, it's something like this, that circles their school grounds. She stands there with a clipboard, and she says, go. <laughs> then when the children get a lap, she gives them a check mark. They do that for 20 minutes. When they accumulate seven miles, they get a little token of sorts. When they accumulate a marathon worth, they get a wristband to put their tokens on. 
And I think the picture of that girl there in the middle, it basically sums up what most kids are going to think about this type of intervention. <laughs> it sucks. Right? It sucks. I think my, my son says there's one girl in his class that takes off like a bat out of hell and runs seven laps for everybody else's one, and everybody else hates it. And, and no wonder, right? It's just terrible. It's not something that's meant for kids. So reason number three, and it sort of interrelates with that second reason, you know, when we do these physical activity interventions, the emphasis has been on adult-led programs. So these are programs led by a teacher, a coach, a referee, a parent, volunteer. They're pre-scheduled. In other words, they happen at a specific time. And they're organized. In other words, you know, they got rules and regulations that need to be followed. And they're very resource intensive. So if it's at a school, you know, there's got to be a lot of training. It costs a lot of money. Or if it's in the community, you've got to spend millions of dollars building arenas, so on and so forth. And I'm going to tell you that these types of programs, and, and the DPA example I said is an example of that. Another example might be sport. And I'm not saying don't do sport. I'm not saying don't do DPA. But I'm saying if you think this is a solution for obesity, childhood obesity, you are kidding yourself. So, so think of how much activity these kids are getting right now and how that might differ than if they were at home watching TV, <laughs> right? So when we got to think about what are kids actually doing in sport and how much sport are they getting? Okay, so this is the sort of an accelerometer profile, the distribution of movement during sport. And this is averaged across many, many different sports. And this includes team sport and individual sports. And you see a third of that time is spent sedentary. So this is like what we just saw in that picture or if you're hockey and you're on the bench, or the Zamboni's on the ice, you're not getting activity. And you could think of light intensity activity. This might be when there's a stoppage in play in hockey, for example, and you're kind of coasting to the, to the new face-off spot, or you know, you're the goalie and you're standing around waiting to get uh, the action to your end. But, and about a third of it is moderate to vigorous physical activity. We also need to think about how much time we can actually get kids to do this. You can't have kids doing hours of sports every day. It would be way too expensive, and, and as a parent of two kids, I can tell you, having each of them in two to three events a, a week, that's six appointments that my wife and I need to go to, uh, about an hour long each. And that's a lot. And I think that's a reasonable, when we say engage in sport, that's a reasonable amount of sport to engage in. So you think about it, two to three times a week, 60 minutes each, that's about 20 minutes when you average across all seven days of the week. Okay, you do 21 minutes of activity at the weight of a child at that sort of that pie there that you see, and you're going to burn 23 calories on an average day. For you dietitians out there, that's like two slices of orange. <laughs> and of course, at hockey, at halftime, at the intermissions, they feed you six slices of orange. <laughs> so it's counterproductive. And I could put similar types of numbers up there for daily physical activity, phys ed at school, walking school bus. And you're going to get the same numbers, if not worse. And that's because the duration is not long enough. And they're not doing it every day, right? I try to get my kids to join the, uh, the walking school bus uh, on March break, uh, summer holidays, and on the weekends. And they refuse to go to school on those times. So any school-based initiative only works on days that kids are in school. Right? Kids don't go to school on their summer holidays. So no wonder. You know, when you think of what people are doing, why, why the meta-analysis conclude that physical activity interventions have a minimal effect on kids' overall physical activity levels and virtually no effect on their weight. Think about what people have been doing. And as Einstein said it, this is, you're absolutely insane if you think that we go back to the board and we say, you know, if I can get, you know, maybe if I can just add one more session of hockey, or, you know, I can add five more minutes of, of daily physical activity. Or rather than having one gym session a week, I can do two. If you think that is going to result in differences for weight, uh, you are kidding yourself. So I'm going to suggest to you that we need to flip our model here. Rather than having things that are led by adults, we should have things that are led by kids. Okay? Rather than having things that are highly organized and structured, we should have things that are highly unorganized. Rather than having things that are you know, bouts of activity, got to do it at this time, spontaneous. Do it in your free time and do it as you see fit. Rather than having things that are resource intensive and very expensive, have things that are free. And that 
creates lack of barriers. You know, when you think of sport, for example, uh, I think we spent thousands of dollars on my kids on sport, uh, and a lot of families could afford that. And last and most importantly, uh, you don't want your kids leaning over like this. In the middle of their activity, it tells you they're not having fun and they're not going to want to continue doing that. So when you think of the physical activity that you might have done as a young person that meets those criteria, it probably looks something like the pictures you see here. Right? It's kids on their own in the woods or in a puddle or in the snow or in the mud or at a park or in their backyard or in their driveway. Kids being kids. And we call this play, outdoor play, active play, free play. I don't care what you call it. This is what I'm talking about. And for those of us that were born in the 1970s and earlier, for many of us, or most of us, this is how we spent most of our free time. And when we think of how kids spend most of their free time now, it is not playing with other kids, unless it's through social media. It is not playing outdoors. It is doing a lot of screen time. So I think we need to think about moving back to what we were in the past uh, when the prevalence of childhood obesity was much lower. So another way we could think of it is this is how much screen time in our recreation, this is not schoolwork, this is recreational screen time, and this is averaged across the days. So we're talking six hours a day. Six hours a day, kids spend more time in front of a screen than in the classroom in the school in, in, when you average it across the year. And they do this, this is every day, seven days a week, right? On weekends, some kids, this is 20 hours on the weekends. They're getting 10 hours a day. This is how much their guidelines suggest, two hours at the most. Okay, so we think of that gap there, that difference, I would suggest we could replace that with active play. This is what kids used to do in their free time and we could take some of that back. So that's a lot of time, right? I'm not talking 20 minutes a day, or I'm not talking 60 minutes on two or three days of the week, I'm talking hours every day or almost every day. And when you're in active play, you're not going gangbusters at moderate to vigorous physical activity the whole time. A lot of that time is spent sedentary, a lot of it at light intensity, and about a third of it at moderate to vigorous. But because the time, the duration is so high, you can expend a lot of calories if you do a lot of active play. And it doesn't cost a lot of money. You know, what, what does it cost to go outside? A pair of shoes, uh, something like that. You can expend a lot of calories, and now we're not, we're talking about a a slice of orange, we're talking about a chocolate bar. So because these are sort of child-led, unstructured activities, the way that we think about intervening them on them is very different as well. Right? We want to get the parents away from the kids, the adults away from the kids, not with the kids. So I, I say this is good news if you're a parent and I'm a parent because you don't have to do a lot. Okay? <laughs> this is what you need to do to your kids. It's a nice day outside. Why didn't you go out and play? I noticed that your friend Xavier is on his bicycle. Why didn't you go say hello? Get outside. That's what we mean by encouragement. Verbal cues. And some of it is more cheerful than others, as any parent would know. This is not, doesn't take a lot of time, doesn't take a lot of effort, it takes no money. Um, but in our experience, it's a very, very strong correlate of how much time kids spend outside playing. Uh, this sounds easy. Uh, I know it sounds easy, but the problem is, is that parents don't want their kids to go outside, and they really limit their uh, ability to move around unsupervised. And we call this independent mobility, and in, in, in a lot of elderly people, we think of this as can they walk around their house and can they tie their shoes. In kids, it's how, how much can they roam away from their home without adult supervision? Okay, and if, if you, you know, look at this data here, 11% of kids, this is 10 to 11 year olds, cannot go outdoors without being supervised. And Eric's laughing and Christy are laughing and I'm thinking, that's just ridiculous, right? Another 24%, they can go outside but they can't leave their property, right? They can go in their driveway, in their yard. Only 13% can wander more than five minutes, five or six minute uh, walk from home. 
And I'm thinking when I was 10 years old, I can remember dri uh, biking down a highway without a helmet on and golf clubs on my back uh, 10 kilometers from home and my parents having no idea where I was or what I was doing. Um, so certainly this has changed over time. And when you restrict independent, it just, kids just can't go anywhere, right? They can't go to their friend's house. They can't go to the park. They can't go to the woods. There's just not a lot of opportunities for them to play. And it gets very boring playing by yourself in your driveway. And the reason this is happening, right, is, is we, the parents perceive things as being very, very dangerous. And then the kids, in turn, end up perceiving this. And we see that the perceptions of safety is a very strong determinant of outdoor play. Well, you perceive your environment or your neighborhood as being unsafe, you're not going to let your kids go out and play. They're going to restrict their independent mobility. And in fact, the perceptions of safety are far, far more important than actual safety. So in other words, if I ask people if they think it's safe, this is what you see. If I actually measure the safety, and here I'm showing you crime rates, and this is the same kids, okay? This is the same kids in the, on the blue as in the, in, the, in the yellow. I'm just showing what they think about how safe their neighborhoods and actually how many crimes from police reports are actually in their neighborhoods. And you can see these perceptions are far, far more important than the actual crime. And the same thing would happen if I put automobile accidents and things like that. And we also see that perceptions of safety are not very strongly related to the actual measures of safety. Okay. In fact, many of the people who think their neighborhoods are the least safe, these are like middle, upper class people that live in the suburbs. And they are petrified that their child is going to get run over by a car or kidnapped or both. Uh, and if we actually look at the statistics on those things, you would see them have gone down drastically in the last 40 years. Uh, Donald Trump might suggest that murders are at a 40-year high. I can tell you that they are at a 40-year low, as are all uh, pedestrian-related fatalities and accidents. So finally, four, this is the bell lap if you like to run the mile, almost at the end. But the most painful part of it of all was the bell lap. So here, the last thing is, is, is I've been talking so far about moderate to vigorous. So this is what the literature has done, and I'm being consistent with the literature, we're emphasizing a single intensity of movement in isolation. But really, we need to think about movement across the whole day and recognize that not only can you get burn calories when you're exercising, you can burn calories when you're doing what the people at the back are doing, standing, and congratulations to you for doing that. You've moved from sedentary to light. And this is important because when you think of the pie, the piece of the pie that is moderate to vigorous physical activity, if you're meeting the guidelines of 60 minutes, it's only 5% of that pie. So even shifting that from 5% to 6% to 7%, which is a lot of moderate to vigorous physical activity, you need to think about, is that actually going to have a huge impact on my energy expenditure, on my health? So we're starting now in the physical activity. We, we actually pay attention now and then to our colleagues in the nutrition and diet field um, who for years have been thinking, you know, about the whole composition of the plate. You know, they don't just think about fruits and vegetables. Those dietitians and nutrition people are very smart. They think about, you know, what about the meats? What about the dairy? What about the sweets? So we need to be thinking this way in physical activity as well and think about the whole composition of movement throughout the day. And we're moving that way, and this is uh, thanks to Mark Tremblay's uh, leadership. We have our first ever sort of integrated or 24-hour movement behavior guidelines that not only talk about moderate to vigorous physical activity, which is the sweat component, they also talk about light intensity physical activity. That's the steps. They talk about reducing sedentary time, particularly screen time. That's the sit. And important uh, not to be forgotten, they talk about sleep, making sure you get enough sleep. So what we see is that, you know, it's great if you can do one of these things, but if you do two or three of those things, the more you do, the better, right? And it makes sense. You're active, you limit your screen time, you sleep well, you're going to do better than if you only do one or two of those things. And again, this is on average. It doesn't mean that it holds true for everybody, but on average, this is what you see. And again, on average, what we see is that children with obesity, and this is kind of, this is difficult to explain this, and I can't point with my pointer, so I'm just going to explain it in words. But what we tend to see is when we look at that whole composition of the day, is that children with obesity, on average, tend to do a little bit worse with their sleep. They don't sleep as much. 
They tend to do a little bit worse with their light intensity physical activity. In other words, they're not standing as much throughout the day. A little bit more sedentary behavior, but proportionally, the MVPA or the moderate to vigorous physical activity is much, much lower than on average. Again, this is not true for everybody. This is on average in the population. So this tells us that, you know, we don't focus on one thing. When we're thinking about physical activity and movement, we got to think collectively across the 24-hour day. So I'll just sum up with a few uh, key messages. So first, when you study physical activity in kids, please recognize that a lot of physical activity is needed, particularly when you're talking about any issues around body weight, preventing obesity, managing obesity, treating obesity, a lot of physical activity is needed. And remember, kids are much smaller than adults, so they require more energy to expend the same amount or require more movement to expend, spend the same number of calories. Second, if you are doing research in physical activity and you're measuring this behavior, please, please, please do a good job of measuring this behavior. You will not be disappointed. It'll, you'll be able to detect all kinds of things that you couldn't detect if you measure it with a questionnaire. Third, if you are doing interventions on kids, please recognize that kids are not adults trapped in small bodies. Kids are different, they, want, they don't want the same structure and organization, they don't want the bouts. On the most part, when you think about prescribing physical activity for kids, you need to think about what kids like to do and what kids are going to do and what they're going to be successful at and enjoy doing. And finally, when you're thinking about physical activity, please remember that we're not just limiting ourselves to that 5% of the day that's moderate to vigorous physical activity. We should be thinking about movement behaviors collectively across the entire day. Thank you all for uh, coming a day late. Uh, thanks, Ian, for that uh, splendid lecture. And I'm now going to call on uh, <laughs> Gorzella, who, is, uh, who also just got here, walking from Saskatchewan, uh, <laughs> uh, to uh, present the award on behalf of the Con Science Committee. Thanks, Aria. And uh, I had the back wind on me, and I didn't walk 4,000 kilometers, so that's why I don't look as good as Ian does. <laughs> so, um, well, I think you can tell by Ian's talk today that uh, he's very well uh, deserving of the Con RCO uh, Award. I'd also like to point out that on those slides, most of the work he showed, and I know there are other people that do this work very well as, as he does, but most of that work he showed today was his own, so he's also a very distinguished researcher as well as a very good lecturer. So on behalf of uh, the Science Committee of Con RCO, I'd like to present you with Diane wants it back. So. <laughs> All right, on that note, uh, well, thank you for all of this. Uh, be careful, you get to keep it till the next summit, and then, uh, and then you give it, right, and then you give it back. So, uh, <laughs> oh, well, you know, there you go. Complaints, that's all we get. All right, <laughs> so, <laughs> so we're not done for the day. Actually, now comes a very important part. Uh, the, there is a reception by the members of the Public Engagement Committee uh, it's going to be right over in the conservatory, which is when you walk out of here, it's going to be right, right outside. There'll be somebody will show you where it goes. Just follow the crowd. Uh, I believe there are drinks and things, so you can just show up there. It's going to be fun. Uh, then you have a gap, finally. Uh, that's when you get to take a little bit of rest. At 8 o'clock, there's a group leaving the lobby for Wild Bills. It's about a 10, 15-minute walk to get there. Uh, I know that the band starts playing at, 10, uh, at 9.30, but there's other stuff happening before there. In fact, you can actually even eat there. So those of you who are wondering where you want to have dinner, uh, that is one opportunity to go. Uh, those of you who want to go elsewhere for dinner, that's fine. Uh, we are downtown on the Strip, so you can you know, have your dinner and then show up. 
uh, and that would be perfectly fun. I promise you it's going to be fun. Uh, apparently the bull is out of commission, somebody broke it. It wasn't us. Um, but I know that there'll be other entertaining stuff that happens there. And remember, as I said yesterday, the social events here is where you really get to network, uh, not just with your local colleagues. You might see them do things that you didn't know they could do. Uh, but you'll also have the opportunity to, in a very informal way, build friendships that I think are really, really important and part of building this community. So uh, uh, on that note, uh, you will get your moderate to rigorous physical activity. Uh, you might not get your sleep. Okay. <laughs> on that note, we'll see you, we'll see you outside.